overcoming attachment-based parental alienation with the nurturing coach. So we are a specialist parental narcissistic abuse, co-parenting and alienation specialist. We work one-to-one -one with clients to support them through the recovery process. And we've also designed programs specifically to help with positive parenting after abuse and preparing for court against a narcissistic ex. Find out more at the website, thenurturingcoach.co.uk. So in this video, we will be covering preventing parental alienation. What can you do before this gets out of hand? And rewriting the false narrative. So if it's already in place, we're going to look at it from a personal perspective, from a parenting perspective, and from a legal perspective. I do want to just make a disclaimer at this point. I'm not legally qualified, so I won't be giving you any specific legal advice, just very general things. Um, obviously, representation is always the best policy if you can manage that. So talking about prevention, let's look right before the separation happens. What are some red flags that come up during the relationship? And I do want to make it clear, this isn't an exhaustive list. This is from personal and professional experience, a lot of the things that have come up. So they belittle your parenting. They ask the children to take sides in arguments. They will share personal information with others to badmouth the targeted parent, you. Uh, they make statements such as, if you ever leave me, you'll never see the children again. Then they may get pregnant when the relationship was about to end. So to keep you in the relationship, that's a very power play for female um, narcissists and, and borderline personality types. They may have an enmeshed relationship with their own parents who have more to say in um, the bringing up of the children than the targeted parent. I actually haven't put this on there, but also they might have experienced alienation themselves. That is also a warning sign. Um, they might discuss an issue with you. You reach an understanding and then they totally go against it because it's, a, again, a power play showing you that no matter what you say, I'm going to do whatever I want. They imply in front of the children that the targeted parent doesn't really know what they're doing with their parenting and they're not listening to a word they say. But equally, they will hand over a lot of the day to day care at home to you. Obviously not in public, because that would go against the narrative that they're putting out there. There will be extreme emotional outbursts. So you might get complete rage or equally the silent treatment. Um, gaslighting you and the children, projecting their own behaviours and emotions onto you and the children, keeping secrets and encouraging you to do the same, very common in dysfunctional families, testing your boundaries and how far they can push you. This is really important so that they can see how much control they have over you, but also it can do, do the next thing, which is they can then ask you to do something questionable. And if you, they've pushed your boundaries and they've seen that you are malleable, then they can either guilt trip you into doing this thing or they'll get angry with you if you disagree. So ultimately you, you end up doing it, but then they can use that against you. So say for example, they've asked you to do something questionable, illegal, um, morally wrong, giving you really no choice in doing that, they will then use that against you. So either within the relationship as a, well, I'll tell everyone what you did, or equally after the relationship has broke up, um, they will control the finances, but equally it might be really, really terrible with money. Um, it's Again, it's that control, but uh, I do as I say, not as I do kind of approach. Like I said, this isn't an exhaustive list, but this will give you a rough idea of the types of behaviours to be looking out for. And if you recognise any of these, the next part of this is going to really help you in getting out ahead. Because let's face it, prevention is better than the cure in the majority of cases. So what we're going to go through is looking at the tactics that the alienators often use, 
what the narrative is that underpins that and some of the professional biases so you can get out ahead of these things so let's have a look so i've separated it out into male and female alienators and i also want to make the point that alienation and alienating behaviors can be done by both the non-resident and the resident parent obviously alienation is easier if it, you are the resident parent because you have more time with them, but the behaviours can start when they're a non-resident and then almost pull them over, align them. So it is important that, that we do recognise that. Um, and the reason I've separated out is there are some subtle differences. When we move on to the narrative and the bias, you know, again, they, they, there are those sorts of differences, but on a whole, they do follow pretty much a stereotypical route. But I wanted at this point just to point out that these are, there are some differences. So let's start with male alienators. So usual tactics, they will accuse you of alienation, abandonment, or being an unfit parent. So they might accuse you of alcoholism, emotional abuse, neglect. Again, there might be other things that they say. Um, they use the child to punish you by creating conflict between you and your child. So when the child comes home, they've got lots of anger towards you. They've been told something about you, usually a lie, but there might be some truth in it, forcing you into a position whereby do I explain myself? It's an adult issue. Do I leave it? But either way, you're, it's almost like you are caught in a catch-22 because you don't respond and you're almost confirming the lie and admitting it, you do respond, you are bringing them into the conflict, which you know is unhealthy for them. Um, they can be engulfing, so they can be, um, this is typically an enmeshed relationship, so there might be infantilization, so making the child much younger than, than they really are, so having full control and, you know, teaching the uh, treating them very much like they're a much younger child. Or equally, there's parentification whereby they speak to them like they're a, they're a surrogate spouse. So they know far too much. They know more about um, the divorce than they should know more about separation. They know more about court. But equally, there's an emotional, um, it's almost incest where they lean upon them. They become their rock. And again, this is very unhealthy for the children. The other part of that is they can be very controlling. So they can get the children to do things either coercively with lots of um, subtle ways of getting that behavior or very authoritative. So pretty much you will do exactly what I say. Otherwise, this is the condition. Obviously, we know with alienators, there's always that underlying current of you do this, you get that. If you don't do this, this is the consequence. Um, but I just wanted to point out that the, they can be evident in one person, by the way. It's not, they're not either, either or, they can be both. So moving over to female alienators, their usual tactics are to make allegations of domestic abuse. If they're not taken seriously, then they can introduce child abuse allegations which will immediately stop contact because allegation of domestic abuse wouldn't necessarily stop contact. It often does, but it, it shouldn't. There should be, I mean, I would always advise whilst the investigations are happening, which we'll come on to, contact remains. But obviously once child abuse allegations are made, then contact would have to stop. And at that point, Obviously, the children are completely under their control. They create a role reversal core and condition the child to reject you. To, and that includes making their own allegations. I have done a complete video on how those things happen. So again, check out. I'll, put, I'll probably put the link in the description for those videos. So at this point, I want to talk about how, how you can stop these things. So the first thing is, obviously, don't get bought into this these tactics, now you know what they are, don't play into them. So if you're being accused of being an alcoholic, for example, I'm not saying don't drink, but be very conscious of if someone has said you're an alcoholic and you are seen at, the, at your local co-op, 
buying a bottle of wine. It doesn't take much for A plus B to equal C. So just be very aware of what those tactics are. Again, emotional abuse. Share your emotions with people that are supportive and understanding, not out there in the general public. Because again, A plus B equals C. Just being aware of these things. So first point is communicate through third parties. Don't have any contact with them because they're going to look to bait you into these behaviours. They're going to want to get evidence that you are and they're going to want an audience to do that. And so when, when you distance yourself from them, it limits the opportunity for them to get that evidence. What it also does is it creates a space, an, an emotional space between you and them, which gives you time to sort of begin processing what you've been through and to start the recovery process. Don't get baited physically or emotionally. You know, the, the text that comes through that accuses you of X, Y, and Z, it's a bait. It's a, it's a wiggly fish on the end of a line. Don't bite. They want you to come back and set and with aggression. They want you to come back and be angry with them for saying these things. Don't bite. It also cuts their supply, which frustrates them. And when you frustrate them, their behavior becomes very dysregulated because they don't want that. They want you to conform. They want you to behave as you've been conditioned to do that. And then obviously this plays into boundaries, which we are going to look at in a little bit. But having those boundaries in place, the emotional ones, the physical ones, energetic ones, if you believe in that, then it will really help you and prevent this from getting out of hand because you're not lining yourself up for more and more allegations to be made. You want to limit the amount of allegations that can be made um, because if one or two and they are made that you're aggressive or that you're, you're um, controlling and then you send a text, one text that has got a bit of an aggressive air, well, you call them a name, you know, you've been, you've been through a lot, it's easy, we all do it from time to time, it fits their narrative. So you've got to limit the amount of opportunities you can give them to do that. So what is the narrative? So this is really important that you understand what is going on from the whole picture. What are they putting out there? Um, so the first thing is that they will always play the role of either the victim, so saying they've, they've been a victim of you or the relationship, you're abusive, you're this, you're that, you're the other, poor them, woe is me, all of that. Or a hero, so they are saving the children from abuse. What this does is it forces you into the role of abuser. And this is all part of the drama triangle and court itself is, is part of that as well. And it's not a safe place for you to be. So you need to be aware that that is the role you're being asked to play. And get, get you ready, what we look at is what does that mean? What does an, being labelled an abuser mean in terms of what are the associated behaviours, looks, communication styles, and how can you not play into that role? It's a, their, their thinking is very black and white, good versus evil. They're good, you're evil. It's splitting. You know, they can't share more than you can't they can't share two different um views of you as being good and bad i.e gray they can't you can't be both you're either one or the other and that, like i say that's a, a clear sign of splitting from a psychological perspective um but you need to know that you need to be aware that they're not going to be reasonable with you as far as they're concerned you are evil they're not going to want to communicate they're not going to want to see you at parents evening they're done this is the emotional cut off for them it's over it's gone and they want nothing more to do with you this is partly for, because of the trauma reenactment so whatever's happened in their childhood is now being played forward in this they've switched their role so that they can now get a better ending for themselves and this is like i say all part of their own um, psychology but it's important that you understand that because you can do it's not personal you know you could have I always tell people you could have been an absolute saint and this would have still happened because this is who they are this is their childhood wounds playing out you have your own wounds that are playing out in this but this is this the alienating behaviors from them 
come from their own trauma, their own childhood trauma. There's also an abandonment and inferiority um, anxiety playing out for them as well. And that's being projected onto you. So they will accuse you of abandonment and, or, and abandoning them. Um, and they also are making you out to be the inferior parent. You're unsafe, you're unfit, you know, all of those things. So I'm going to recommend two books for you now if you've got pen and paper. Um, first one is um, Foundations by Dr. Craig Childress. You've probably already read that, but if you haven't, get it. It will, I mean, it's a bit wordy. I'm not going to lie. Childress likes to repeat himself quite a bit, but it explains what you're going through to perfection. It gives you a very in-depth understanding. I will just put a caveat in there that you will probably know more than the professionals, but be aware of that and don't try and force it upon them. This knowledge is for you. It is not for you to shove down someone else's throat. It is about you being aware of what is happening for your children and for yourself. If you start telling the professionals what's going on before they've made it, before they've come to that conclusion themselves, you again, you're playing into the narrative that you are controlling and you think you're so superior and better than everyone else, which we know people understand as being narcissistic. So be very careful with what you do with this information. And the second one is, I think it's called Divorcing a Narcissist by Bill Eddy. It's absolutely brilliant at sort of looking at the legal side as well, which, like I said, I'm not going to go into that, but it really, it really covers... Um, the process that you will go through. So the next one I want to look at is bias, understanding professional bias. <coughs> Sorry. So professionals are rescuers by nature. So looking at that drama triangle, again, abuser, perpetrator, rescuer. So they're always looking for a victim. That's why they went into this field. And I'm mainly talking about social workers, so CAFCAS workers, but also family court judges can have this element within them as well. They chose this as opposed to property or business um, law. So it, 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 there's potentially this rescuer dynamic in, the, in their own um, ego. So their own agenda can sometimes take over if allowed. So you've got to be very aware of that drama triangle and don't play into it. Like I say, we do look at this more and get you ready so that you're not playing into all of these roles that are being laid out for you so the first thing i want to talk about by is, is there are two active systems going on for most people so system one is essentially an autopilot system in which we do things easier and through repetition it filters out things in the environment that are irrelevant at that moment and it has a high efficiency it's based on the idea that neurons fire together wire together and it primes an idea so that one idea is more easily activated schemas is is what we call it so you say a word and it attaches to another word so you say uh red shoes you might think wizard of oz because that's the way our brains work um another one has a bias towards making thinking cheap and enables one to deal with information overload so thinking about this in the context of family court they do this every day they make this is the assessments are their repetition they are on autopilot a lot of the time. And so although alienation is becoming more and more common, their old autopilot system was probably very different. It was probably more of a um, bang the parents head together, put them on the separated parents information program and they'll realize what they're doing and boom, easy. Obviously, parental alienation is way more complex than that, but they might still be following system one. System two it corrects and adjusts that perceptual blindness associated with system one, and it allows flexibility, giving nuance and precision more importance. So it's associative and intuitive, while system two, sorry, system one is associative and intuitive, while system two is analytical and deliberate. And this is we want them more in system two unless they're absolutely brilliant and they get parental alienation 100%. And then obviously system one will kick in because they'll, they'll have that schema of, oh, so if a child is parroting what their parent says, then I know that that's a, um, a red flag for parental alienation. They'll automatically go to the child impact um, reference and look at look sort of 
manually look at that in their own head. But for some, a lot, <laughs> they're in system one and they're acting on that old, old model. So we want to shift them into two. So we're going to look at each bias individually and how we can overcome them. So first one is cognitive heuristics. And this is information drawn from intuitive judgments. What you want to be doing is you want to be utilizing this intuitive element of the bias. And we do this by teaching you the language of the court so that you are speaking the same language. When we speak the same language as someone, we feel familiar to them, we build that rapport. We also show you uh, child protection language. My background is child protection, um, Sarah Squires. And so it will make them feel like you're part of their world, subconsciously, not, not consciously. And therefore they were more likely to intuitively trust you. So we're using our knowledge of system one to bypass or to utilize it. I've used the right word there. Utilize this particular bias. Next one is availability bias, uh, availability heuristic, sorry. And it's easier to recall the consequences of something, the greater those consequences are often perceived. And this is why those allegations are like grenades. It's seemingly, you know, when there's such a big public um, agenda around domestic abuse, which I support wholeheartedly, domestic abuse is, is very damaging for children, but the narrative around that is slightly skewed. We need to understand domestic abuse more, but because it is such a high agenda and in, in, in people's consciousness, that grenade can feel like the consequences are greater. So therefore they will recall, oh God, domestic abuse is terrible for children. Therefore this person has been accused of domestic abuse must be awful and must be kept away from children because it's terrible for them. So how do we overcome that? Well, we focus on the facts and we make relevant information more readily available, which therefore makes it more powerful. So you want to be looking at the secrets to communication so it's so that, that your information is received first and with the most conviction. This applies to your, your writing of position statements, your court bundles, everything. You want to make sure that the relevant information and the consequences are there up front so it's available to them. And I say knowing this gives you a, a really great um, advantage in making sure that these biases don't take control of your case. Next one, representativeness, heuristic, that's a mouthful. Judgments are based on superficial similarity and stereotypes, so un are unsuitable for complex cases. As I've just talked about, you know, there is unfortunately a stereotype that all domestic abuse allegations must be true and all men must be perpetrators of domestic abuse. All well, mums are nurturing and loving and caring. Now, both, both can be true, but equally both can be false. And so this is about making sure that you feel familiar to your professionals that are involved. Um, so like I say, coming back to building that rapport um, and also highlighting it is a complex case, you know, it, you want to be, but you want to be making it as easy as possible. We're going to look at the legal perspective. How can we break this down so it is simpler for people? The effect heuristic emotions affect judgment, which can lead to emotional reasoning. So Bill Eddy calls this becoming a negative advocate. So although in other words, flying monkeys. Um, so managing your emotions is so important because you will be taken much more seriously. Your ex can't bait you into a reaction and this will all ensure that you are, you are preventing this particular bias from gaining any momentum in your case. You are limiting the emotional element of your case. They will, your ex will shove all their emotions at it, but you need to stay in that calm composed place which is hard and we're going to look at that but the more you can the more you don't play into these these bias so anchoring effects judgments are made on the initial information only and adjustments are not made for any new information so make a good first impression you know 
make sure that you are polite, friendly, you are easy to work with rather than antagonistic, defiant, confrontational, because these create a very strong impression of you and feel, you know, they fit that narrative. So be aware of that. Also ensure that all of your information is fact-based, not subjective, but objective. It's very much about what you can evidence. And as I said before, making sure that in your position statements, in your conversations, that the most important stuff is given early on, and then you can then you can fill in you know the context around it. But it's all about the delivery. Confirmation bias: information is sought to prove a belief rather um, rather, and evidence which contradict, contradicts it is ignored. So you know, how do you powerfully refute false allegations? And the most powerful way is in your behavior. If you're being accused of being a domestic abuser or being emotionally unstable, it's your behavior that ultimately, your words are gonna have less impact than your behavior. So being consistent, being an assertive communicator rather than an aggressive communicator, managing your emotions during hearings and meetings, these are all going to stop this bias. Premature closure, so diagnosis are finalized before all evidence is gathered and assessed. Work with the process and get very clear on what your goal is from the outset for you more than anything. But when you go with the process rather than fight against it all the time, you know, if you're fighting against everything, professionals are going to want to shut it down, but then they're going to, it's going to be cause stress for them. And they're going to want to just be like, oh, for God's sake, let's just close that case. What you want is for them to have an easier, I'm not saying easier ride in terms of they're not um, doing their job, but I, if you work with them rather than against them, then they're more likely to give you the time and the effort that is needed on these cases. Framing errors, drawing conclusions based upon how the information is presented. You've got to organize yourself and your evidence to ensure it's in line with core expectations. A lot of people, when they've been in these situations, it's like verbal diarrhea. They blurt, blurt everything out all in one go. And as we talked about, you know, you want to be given the most important information first, but also in a very factual format. And there's so much truth in the fact that people will believe the story if they believe the storyteller and you are the storyteller. So you need to be believable. And again, we look at what does that mean? How does that look? What behaviours are more believable? And how can you present as the person that is more believable than the other? Because at the end of the day, your ex is going to be inconsistent. They're going to flip because that is who they are. And a lot of it is they're reactional because they're very emotional. You know, they don't look it. They might look very cold, but actually... It, that they react to their own internal drivers much faster, hence the personality disorder part. Fundamental attribution error. So an observer incorrectly assigns a dispositional characteristic or internal cause rather than external and situational cause. So this is very common. As I said before, you're accused of being abusive and you come in and you're angry or argumentative. Ding, tick, you are that person. Equally, you're labelled as being unstable, then you come in and you, you they ask you a question and you start crying, boom, tip, you are that thing. So learning to regulate your own emotions is what is going to help you with this. So base rate neglect, failure to consider prior probability, keep everything child focused and use facts about your prior relationship with your children. Photographs do not tell the full story. You know, Videos are slightly better, but they're not necessarily going to watch them. If you've got cards, you know, um, any real life examples of the relationship that you used to have with your children, that is really important. Um, an ecological fallacy, the use of group data to draw conclusions about individuals. So stereotypes, um, just don't conform to those behaviours. Be aware of what they are. Again, we cover this and get you ready. This it's about what do these what what assumptions do we make about someone who is accused of being an abuser 
what do we think they're going to look like? What do we think they're going to talk like? Including the tone, the volume, all of those things are important. Don't do it. Don't be that person. Be nurturing. Be loving. How, what does that look like? We practice all of that. So very powerful um, and hopefully giving you an idea there of how we can prevent. So the next thing I want to look at is rewriting the narrative. So we're going to look at it from a personal, parental and legal perspective, but I want you to notice we're not focusing on your ex at all. This is all about you. So first off, boundaries, codependency and trauma bonding. So boundaries, your own, but also respecting other people's, listening, spatial boundaries. So not sending too many texts to them, you know, it's very easy for non-molestation orders to be given out and you can play a part in that, you know, before you, before that happens, don't do any of those behaviours, be aware of someone's personal boundaries, even if you think that they're wrong, be aware of how it can be interpreted. So be very considerate of your text and you don't get a response. Don't send another one in like three minutes. 10 minutes, you know, be realistic. And, you know, you've got to think how, how would an independent observer view your behaviors? How is this being viewed through a, or how could this be viewed through a lens of someone thinking, is this person abusive? Be aware of that and put boundaries in place. Your own boundaries, as we've spoken about, is making sure that emotionally you aren't giving them anything. Don't get angry in front of them. Don't show them that you're upset. They feed off of this. That it brings them, it, it makes them feel better to see you struggling because, you know, they're empty souls, but they, they are miserable and they want you to be miserable. Misery loves company. And so don't give them that. It will help your case enormously because when you don't give them what they want from you, they dysregulate and when they dysregulate they do all the behaviors that you know that they do that they are you know they do project they are blaming they they're not quite right you know they they will reveal themselves when you put your boundaries in place and like i say respect theirs as well you've got to be aware of your codependent traits i would guarantee that you've got them i have i i'm recovering codependent but understand it Great blog on the website all about codependency and narcissistic abuse. Have a read through and understand how it looks, what's the what it says about you and heal those things because codependency and trauma bonding are linked. It's very hard for people with codependent traits to leave relationships. And so you need to understand how all of these things are playing in your behavior. So what, for example, codependency, the stage three of codependent behaviors is almost obsessive. And you might be being obsessive. Now you might, you might think that, you know, I'm, this has happened. They're not talking to me. They're not letting me know what my kids are doing, but then there'll be an element of this is, that is your codependent traits that are coming through. An obsession can look like very, unsafe you know it can look um abusive stalkerish you know you've got to be aware of how the codependent traits within you can be misinterpreted and heal those things we look at trauma and triggers in get you ready um but also one-to-one -one support get the therapy so that you can recover yourself this is important for you and your children because you do not want your children growing up repeating these patterns you know if you're trauma bonded to your ex it's a very push-pull dynamic and you can easily get lured back in you can get hoovered back in and then get baited so they might send you a text message and said i've been thinking and you know we could try and work this out why don't you come round? and we'll talk about it you're trauma bonded to them maybe you know those codependent traits maybe with your children as well you go around and it's a trap you know their, their family are there and they're all having a go at you wanting you to react 
you, if you're trauma bonded, you're more likely to fall into those things. So healing gives you a chance not to get set up so that they can then get evidence to make these allegations. Emotional regulation, as we talked about, you need to be able to regulate yourself. You need to know what happens in my body when I'm feeling angry. Does my jaw tighten? Do my fist clench? You know, do my cheeks go red? What is my physical reaction to it? What what's the what's the preceding physical responses before I open my mouth? Because you need to catch it. You need to catch. I'm not saying don't feel anger. I, I, I think you've got to feel the full array of emotions. And when you've got PTSD, as I said, you know, this is all very much impacted by that makes it more difficult. But when you are able to, you know, they, your ex says something, they accuse you of something horrific in court in front of everyone. Your natural reaction is to feel shocked, angry. You're going to want to defend yourself. Boom, mouth open, anger. It fits into the narrative. So when you can, they say that and you can go, oh God, I can feel that anger rising, but I know that this is what they want. They want me to angrily respond. I can't do that. I need to take a few deep breaths. You've got to recognize it before it happens. And that's emotional regulation. What do you need in that moment? I need to take a few deep breaths. I need to calm down. I need to say, I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. It's okay. There is no physical threat. I am okay. So cognitive processing, again, impacted by PTSD, but you need to be able to organize your thought processes and get court ready. We have the evidence tracker, which will help you, helps you to organize your evidence, which can really help with the cognitive processing element. But get practicing on to do lists, you know, puzzles, really try and spark up the cognitive processing part of your brain. So communication and relational style. There's so much on this that we cover and get you ready, but I'm going to do the basics with you. So communication and relational style. So first off, communication styles are pretty much assertive in the middle. And then you've got passive one end, aggressive the other. Obviously, you've got passive aggressive, which is like coercive control. But I'm going to stick that with the aggressive side. So on that scale... Your ex will probably try and pre present as being passive. It's really passive aggressive, but they will try and look passive. So when you come in and you're um, a bit more aggressive, um, you maybe are controlling with that, you're going to look very, you're going to look at the other end of the scale. You're going to look that aggressive communication. And that there's so much around that. There's, you know, how do you physically stand, the tone of your voice, all of those things play into what an aggressive um, communication style looks like. What it also looks like, and these terms might be easier for you to sort of visualize, is a passive communication style is almost like it's a conformist child. So just going along, yes, okay, yes, that's fine, yeah, I agree. Um, a critical parent is that aggressive style. So, but you're doing this, you're doing that, you're not good enough at this, you should be doing that. So if you're a critical parent and they're passive, who looks like they're the problem? It's really easy when you think of it like that. Now, you might know that they're not really being passive. Actually, they're being passive aggressive. But if you respond from a critical parent, you're the one that looks like the problem. When you shift into the adult assertive, then it becomes obvious that they are the child. But equally, it becomes obvious if they're being passive aggressive or aggressive. You've got to stay in that adult assertive state. Again, we look at this in more detail in Get You Ready. Relational style. So professionals you know I've, I've just shared with you all the mistakes that professionals can make and they are all true and it's really important that you know them but what's also important to know is they are human beings and they are being love bombed by your ex who is so wonderful so kind to them come on in can I get you a drink oh I like your shoes you know isn't it a lovely day you know they're very charming and so they are love bombing them as I say and 
when you have this perception of professionals, whether that be Kafka, uh, social worker, family support worker, the judge, whoever, you have an opinion of them that they're going to make a mistake, they're going to mess this up, they're a liar, they've done this, or you think the worst before every single meeting. What happens in relational style communication is you go in thinking the worst, they respond to that by then thinking the worst of you, and boom, you are butting heads straight away, which ruins your relationship with a professional and basically gives everything to your ex because they're on their side all of a sudden because they don't like you either. Um, so you've got to be aware that even though you know these things are possible, you have to go into every meeting Okay, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to believe them. I'm going to I'm going to think the best of them. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be considerate. You know, I'm going to be very polite, not over the top, but I'm going to be polite. They will then respond to that in a much better way. And even if they don't, don't switch. Be yourself. I said this to my client the other day. You don't know what they've had happen before they come to you. They might have just had an argument with their partner. They might have found out that they're car failed its MOT or they've got a huge bill going out or their manager's just had a big go at them. You don't know that their bad mood is anything to do with you. It could be something else. Don't respond to it. Don't take it personal. Stay adult, stay assertive, stay kind, no matter what comes back at you. Trust me, in the long run, that will massively pay off. And the final one is mindset and vision. You've got to be in that right frame of mind. You've got to be positive. You've got to believe that you can make this happen. You know, you've got to stay in your really positiveness. Negativity breeds negativity. Every time you, you know, something doesn't quite go your way, you can't be going, oh God, it's terrible. They're this, they're that, spiraling out of control because it will just get worse and worse. You have a, something that doesn't go your way, push yourself off, pick yourself up, get on with it, go in next time, more positive. Have a clear vision of what you want to achieve, what your life's going to look like when it goes the way you want it to. How amazing is it going to be to have the kids waking up in the morning, you're all feeling so much more relaxed, so much more at ease, knowing that you've got this, no matter if you've got to have a co-parenting relationship or what, you've got this, you can do this. Focus on that and you will find that so much more changes for you. So the next one I want to look at is parental. So first off, it's got to be parallel parenting. It protects the child from conflict. Children will think that it's their fault. If they see and witness conflict, they'll think that it's their fault. Even if they blame you outwardly, internally, they think it's because of them. Parallel parenting protects the child. So if the court is saying they either don't understand it or they don't want you to use it, just say to them, look, even if we just do it temporarily, I don't want my child thinking that if we have if things are a bit frosty on contact uh, and on handovers, I don't want my child thinking that that's their fault. And so I want to protect them. Therefore, parallel parenting gives us that space in order to do that. Make it from the child's perspective, not from yours. Use an app if possible. Our family wizard is the, the, the best for the, for the high conflict ones, but there are a range of others in different price ranges. Um, if, you, if that can't happen, limit it to one form of communication. Have boundaries around it. And this is for you and for them. So as I talked about before, you know, limit the amount of messages or emails or whatever you send, depending on, the, on what model, uh, mode of communication you use limit it have an agreement of how long is reasonable to expect a response within um and just have those because it prevents you from falling into a trap if you know you you give each other 24 hours to respond unless it's an emergency again you could do with identifying what is an emergency what isn't an emergency but that that's in communicating with a narcissist the book if you haven't read it already is available on amazon um with those boundaries so you know if you've, you've agreed you've, you've you've both got to respond within 24 hours don't send another message within 24 hours wait for the response and obviously you know 24 hours and one minute it's gonna look a bit dickish 
but just be aware of those boundaries and how you are going to look but make sure that, that where possible get those things in place it will save you a lot of time and energy and it will also help your recovery stay child focused please remember that your experience is not your child's you are older you've been through a lot of other things you've got your childhood wounds you've got other relationships you've got this relationship all that are created filters that you see your life through that lens your child doesn't have any of those so be mindful of not projecting your experience onto your child i know that your ex is going to do that but you do not want to be doing it as well so be mindful of the fact that just because you think your ex is a so-and-so, your child doesn't. Your child inherently loves you both. No matter what they're saying, they love you both. And so you've got to remember your experiences are separate. Understanding your own needs and behaviours. So from an attachment-based approach, what I'm really talking about is the child will call and the parent responds. So... The child might be really happy and comes in skipping. Parent responds with, oh, what are you so happy about? Great quality, really good. But child is free to express themselves. Parent responds appropriately. Secure attachment on, on that process. Child comes in skipping. Parent ignores or, oh, why are you so happy? Misattunement not a secure attachment now that isn't i'm not saying that you know on a one-off occasion that that is indicative of the whole of your attachment style but just be aware that these can build up and it is particularly impacted by complex ptsd mental health fear you've got to be very much aware of your own role in that so when what is your response are you attuned you're not always going to be attuned in every single moment, but you need to be attuned as often as is possible. If you're struggling with complex PTSD, your mental health or your, your negative emotions, get help. Like I said, we are experts in supporting you through this. Do you get in touch and get that support. It will pay dividends for you in the long run in protecting that relationship between you and your child. It limits the amount of opportunities you've got for your child to make an allegation because their experience will be very different I'm not saying that they, they won't lie but actually when a child when you respond appropriately and effectively to your child's calls then you know they are going to they're going to keep that in their mind they're going to remember that they're going to know that that secure attachment is very, very hard to break, much harder than an insecure attachment or a disorganized attachment. So really important to focus on those. So the ideal model is the parent regulates themselves. Um, so you, if you're struggling with um, complex PTSD, you're in a fear state, you're angry, you know, you just had a text and you're really peed off and your kid comes through the door, you need to regulate your emotions before you have that interaction. Whatever that means, if it's go, go for a fag, you know, I'm not condoning smoking, but if that calms you down, do that. Go Take a few deep breaths. You know, whatever it is that you need to do to regulate your emotions, do that. Then come into co-regulation with your child. So pick up on where, where your child is, your emo the, the emotions that they are calling in for you so it might be that they need comfort it might be that they need a bit of security it might be that they just need a cuddle and some love um whatever it is you can then when you're regulated you're able to co-regulate with them and it's led by you because you're in a regulated state and that then you sort of pull back and your child will self-regulate themselves that's an ideal model and we talk about this more in the circle of security parenting program that we run um, we run that three times a year it's, very, it's all attachment based so it's perfect for dealing with parental alienation and um, co-parenting with the narcissist because it follows this very specific model um, so if you're not having access to your children think about what is a parent really and um, yes of course it is those day-to-day -day acts 
It is the getting them up, putting them to bed. I appreciate that it's all those things and that's really heartbreaking if you're missing out on those things. But let's bring it right back. You know, let's focus on what it is and what, what, is, what it still is for you. It's in your DNA. Your DNA is in them. So no matter what your ex does, no matter what they say, what they do, how long you don't see them for, your DNA is in their body and she, they can't get rid of that. It exists. So at some point, you are going to become really important to your child. They might need a blood transfusion one day. They might need, um, I mean, I wouldn't wish any of these things on, but at some point, their DNA is going to become important to them. And that's you. And they can't ignore that. So remember that no matter what happens, you are linked. You are always linked. I also personally believe that DNA is so much more than the strands and the, and the proteins. It's also an energetic connection. So your DNA is connected to you as much as it is to your child. So there's always a connection between you. And you can, I liken it to a highway. So that connection always exists. You've got to be very aware of what you're sending down that highway. Send love, and we're going to come on to that in a second. But just be aware that because your DNA is within them, that highway is always, 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 always open always so next one is biological and physiological so your child will have some of your qualities and that means every time they look in the mirror they're gonna see you they are they might not look identical to you but they might have your color eyes they might have your color hair they might have some physical features but even if it's not a physical thing you they are going to be reminded of you their voice might be similar to yours there's lots of things lots of similarities again that they you can't escape so you are always with them you know in those times where you feel very detached from them remember you're always with them because you are them you are one you are the same you are joined not not in an enmeshed way but you know you are part of one another and the final one and most important one for me is your heart the, the connection between your hearts can never be severed. No matter what it looks like on the outside, believe me, in their heart, that love remains. It might be buried. It might be, you know, surrounded by darkness, but it's there. That light exists within them and that love exists. That's what you have to focus on. I also want to make the point here that calling behaviours do not always look like calling behaviours. When your child is angry at you, or is it or is rejecting you and calling you all these horrible names they are calling behaviors they are crying out for love and for security that has just become very distorted as to how they get that but when you can view it as that that doesn't mean you go flying in and try and rescue them and tell them oh this is what you're feeling but you remember OK, so when my child is called, call it, calling me all the names under the sun, what they're really saying is I'm feeling a bit afraid and I need some security. So when you give back, when you respond, however that may be, you respond from that place of giving them that emotional security, which moves on to the next point, which is be that safe space for them. Love them. Trust them. Trust that they'll figure this out. Trust that your love is stronger than anything. I haven't brought this up yet, but I am going to do this. You know, this, this is playing out an abandonment wound. You've got to heal that abandonment wound. And when you heal that, you don't just heal it for you, you heal it for them. Parent from love, not fear or hate. Remember that highway. Don't be sending down hate and don't be sending down fear. When you can parent from love, when you can stay as often as possible in your heart, in center with it and be love then they feel that that's your way of state keeping you know parenting them is through that highway send that love down get support for your anger grief frustration because it will benefit them as i say any healing that you do is in their dna as well you don't have to believe this but what's the harm in believing it it will only do them good OK, so the final area we're going to look at is legal. As I said, I'm not legally qualified, so mine is very general advice around this based on 
my work with people going through this process. So option, you've basically got three options. You can self-represent, you can self-represent with a McKenzie friend supporting you, or you can get lawyers and barristers involved. I would say to you, do not consider one, so self-representing, if you haven't done the work on the first two areas. So if you haven't done the work on what parenting is and parallel parenting and all of that, and you haven't done the work on you know, um, understanding the tactics, the narrative and all the biases, don't attempt to self-represent because you're going to play into the narrative. You're going to look like you're controlling, abusive, unstable, all of those things, and you will activate the confirmation bias. So just be aware that if you if you don't do the work, self-representation is going to be a lot harder. If you self-represent with a McKenzie friend, then they might be able to help you um, with the presentation. I would still recommend, I mean, I would recommend doing the work for all options, it will massively help, but definitely without a shadow of a doubt, do not consider self-representing if you haven't done that work. I see it time and time again, and it's messy and can end up, oh God, in the most horrendous, horrendous situations. If you do choose option two or three, absolutely make sure that they 100% understand attachment-based parental alienation. That's why you've got to do the work first so that you know it when you see it. So speak to three or four options, ask them some key questions to assess their understanding and strategy. And I want you to be feeling, does this feel right? Based on what I know, what I've read about this. And Craig Children has also done a book um, around um, the legal side of it. Obviously, it's American based, but it will give you an idea. Some of the constructs aren't necessarily fully in use, but you need to understand what a, what a case should go like and I'm going to share a bit about that in a second but so that when they give you answers you can think well that doesn't sound right and so then you can go no they're not going to work for me also as we talked about communication styles you want to be looking for this in your representation as well you want your representation who is you you know they're acting as you you know if they come across as being aggressive they're going to assume that you're aggressive you want to again be choosing someone who's assertive rather than aggressive or passive because that again will play into the narrative. So first, first hearing, um, if false allegations are made, which some will be submitted prior, but they'll use a C1A form to submit their allegations. If they are made, ask for a fact finding hearing under practice directive 12J. You can, if a C1A has been filled in by them or equally if they are making they've made allegations prior to the hearing then you can also respond with a c1a which is your response to allegations of harm and domestic abuse so that just puts across your tech your um your response to their allegations um from the fact finding i've i found there's two basic outcomes no findings are made in um which you know it's not a it's not a uh, thingy court, uh, um, uh, criminal court. So it's not a case of you're not guilty, but no fines have been made, which is also almost the same thing in terms of the family court. They can't be used. Um, or findings are made against one or both parties. Now, depending on who that one is, obviously, if it's against you, then you need to, again, I would still be asking for an expert at this point, but if those allegations are relevant, you know, you've got a decision to make. If allegations, if findings are made against you, you know, you need to be looking at the relevance of that and how it plays in. If it's made against both of, if it's made against the other person, okay, so they might be finding of emotional abuse, for example, you want to be going for the expert. If it's made against both of you, which happens sometimes, it might be that you've done something, but they've done something as well. Whatever the outcome of these fact findings, <coughs> you need an expert under practice directive 25 because if someone makes allegations and they're unfounded, that's abuse and there's something not quite right because normal people wouldn't do that. If there are findings made, you need someone to dissect the dynamics. I personally would recommend someone who is trained in the dynamic maturational model, or DMM, which is an attachment assessment. The reason is it's very scientific. 
it, and it's attachment based. So if you're looking at attachment based uh, parental alienation and attachment assessment matches, it, it fits together really well. It also, because it's scientific, it gets to the core issues for both parents. So it can provide a really good model for treatment and very robust and clear consequences and recommendations moving forward. So that would be my recommendation. The faster you can get into this area so you can get an assessment done, the better with parental alienation. You need it diagnosed ASAP. Some, some of them will not go for this, but I would be arguing very strongly for the, all those reasons that whatever the outcome is, the fact finding, the fact that it needed doing suggests that we need an expert that um, to really go through this and to diagnose. So if you've been struggling with long-term alienation, um, so you're way down the line of, of first hearings, depending on the age of your children, I would still be asking for an expert because the DMM will highlight risks and that makes it harder for the court to ignore. So what I've found is a lot of, a lot of people can get a diagnosis of parental alienation from an expert, but the consequences aren't always as, or the recommendations aren't always clear and robust enough and so the court tends to take a very soft approach and be like well we acknowledge that alienation is happening but it's been going on so long we think it's less of a risk to the children to to stay and so therefore we're not going to do anything about it which kind of in my opinion defeats the purpose of asking an expert for their opinion anyway but it does happen unfortunately with the dmm the risk can be really obvious, you know, the long term impact of leaving a child in this situation are X, Y and Z. That's a lot harder for, for a judge and a professional to sit with. You know, they're not going to want to go, oh, God, OK, so this this has proven that the long term consequences are going to be, you know, suicide and um self-harm and depression and mental health problems psychiatric problems they're going to be much more reluctant to go yeah but we don't care so we're going to leave them where they are so you know i would still be asking for a, for an assessment at that point and then if contact is resumed based on, on those outcomes you've got to get the right support because although children can reunify really quickly in some cases in others, and particularly those where they are enmeshed with their parent, or if the other parent still has unsupervised contact, it can be incredibly stressful for all parties, and you can find that it becomes impossible because the other parent just has too much influence over them. So getting the right support limits that, and it really does help the um, you to, to rebuild that relationship. If your children are over, over 14, normally, they are deemed as being Gillick competent, which essentially they can vote with their feet. At this point, you know, that's really hard to take. And I get it because you know that they've been emotionally manipulated. So even though they might technically be old enough, you know, they're not competent because they've been emotionally and psychologically abused. However, that is does tend to be the way the court finds it. I'm not saying don't go for an expert, but I'm just warning you that they, you know, a lot of, a lot of cases will be, they're old enough to, will go with what they say. Um, so at this point, I will be focusing on creating your own safe space and look to connect in other ways. Remember, be the parent that you would be if they were in your life. Don't fall to depression. Don't fall to alcoholism. Imagine that they were watching. You know, great advice, behave as if you think your child is always watching. Be that parent because they need to see that, you know, just because you don't think your children are interested doesn't mean they're not spying on you in some way, shape or form. Make sure that what they see is what you want them to see. Work through your grief, anger, frustration so that you can come back into your heart. You can parent from love. As I say, we've explored what parenting means, but you can send up and down that highway love not all those negative emotions so get the support and deal with that like i said we are a specialist uh, therapy team so do get in touch finally never give up on the love it will always exist and who knows what will happen in the future just i tend to describe it to my parents in this situation 
think of it like a tug of war. You're on one end, the other parent's on the other, and the child is the rope. Letting go of the rope does not mean that you're no longer loving your child. You just don't want them to be the rope anymore. You don't want them under all that stress and that strain. You can love them without treating them as rope. Um, so I hope that's really helped. Um, we've got two programmes available. Get Caught Ready. These are both online programmes, so you go through it in your own time. We can offer support around it if necessary. Get Caught Ready is prior to your first hearing, so it's getting you prepared with all that emotional regulation, building a strategy, looking at the narrative in a bit more detail for you. Um, and Get You Ready is for those longer term cases, so we look at rewriting the narrative. We look at how you can communicate. We look at what your trauma and triggers are. We look at everything that we've looked at today, but in much more depth if you are interested in those they're available on the website which is www.thenurturingcoach.co.uk thank you for watching do leave comments share and like if you got value from this take care everyone and thank you